Who was at the event last year, the HBAN event? Quite a lot of you. Well, probably about a third of you. Good. Okay. Well, don't worry. There's only one slide that's the same, which you probably won't recognise, but it's the same sort of topics to do with syndication, in this case, deal um, uh, team sports. So, first of all, um, I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes max, if I can do that, and then I want to, uh, to open for questions, because in the end, it's what you want to hear, not what I want to say. I'm just going to give you basically three or four slides on uh, angel investing being team sport. Slight introduction to me. Uh, my son was actually with uh, me last year. Uh, since then, we, as John keeps plugging, which is good, as an entrepreneur, a long-term entrepreneur, I'm very keen to always to sell something. Product market fit is only done by finding uh, customers. Uh, and we've since published the book, and which we've got some out there, and done a whole load of podcasts with some very interesting people. Anyway, so he's not here today. That's my son and I. Um, my what I want you to do is to, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a saying or a mantra within Alcoholics Anonymous, and I don't have a problem saying I'm a recovering alcoholic, 19 years. One of the sayings in Alcoholics Anonymous is that you must listen out for the similarities, not the differences. Just because I, what I've done in my journey is different from you doesn't mean we have enough similarities that you can learn from what I've done. The fact I've got 67 investments, which is very hard work, both finding and investing, doesn't mean you all need to do that to get returns and to enjoy what you're doing. My, my journey, and these are some of the investments, was purely I stumbled into angel investing about 10 years ago by investing in a guy I was mentoring, didn't even know what an angel was then, about 11 years ago, and we exited quite quickly. This was a service business that went into product, the same as one of the, um, I think one of the other speakers. It's something that angels struggle to invest in. You can never really trust a, an entrepreneur who's selling a service to actually productize. This guy did do, we had an exit, and then I found I really enjoyed it. So I then got involved through the Cambridge Angels Group, which is what probably one of the most active angel groups in Europe. Um, we invested in euros just under 30 million euros last year, the, th the 60 of us, uh, mostly exited entrepreneurs. And I joined it as a lowly sort of person and I've been chair of it for the last three years and everything I've learned is from the group. And that's a really important lesson. The best people to learn from are the people who've done it before you, which in fact is to go back to the AA you know, uh, uh, connection, which is probably the last time I mention it, the people who are new to addiction recovery learn from the others and this is really important the more you network with the other people that you know the more groups you belong to or even just one group get actively involved you learn more from that so just briefly before I go on to the, the core subject is why do I do this I do this because I absolutely adore it I adore spending time with entrepreneurs with investors I adore uh, adore looking uh, you know, exploring new technologies new business markets etc I don't necessarily do this for the money. That's really important. If you think you're going to guarantee to make money, then please make sure you've got a very big portfolio because it does need, you need to spread the risk. I do it because I really, really enjoy it. And if that's true of hopefully everybody in this room, you will not mind losing the money you inevitably will do at times because not every journey works. Something like at least three quarters of journeys don't work. So I've invested in a whole load of logos, none of which you'll know because I do B2B. These are mostly very small and they're mostly, in fact, almost exclusively based in, in, on the mainland in the United Kingdom. So let's just run through two things. These are my sports. Now then, I've never played with Bill Gates, who you can see there in the blue shirt, but I do play bridge. I class that as a sport, a mind sport. And the one on the right, the, does anybody recognize the court? There's one in Dublin which isn't used. It's called real tennis. It's the tennis that was invented in the 17th century or even 16th century, which became lawn tennis. And it's played indoors. And that's the court I play on um, in Cambridge, which you play off the roof and down. And then it's a very strange game. Anyway, those are the two sports. So to me, that's just the segue into the next bit, which is uh, the, the angel investing is a team. So the advantages of invest a team, I think we've probably covered this quite a bit during this session already, but I'm going to put a slide up, which I put up last year, because it's just as important. And I'm not going to dwell on it, but I'll just show you what it is. First of all, there's going to be a rather frightening statistic here, which came from 
There's something called fool's gold. Do not necessarily believe that, but it is a very, very risky thing we're doing. You mustn't allocate more. They say more than 10% of your disposable wealth. I've invested more than that. I've taken very big risks. I, I, you know, I'm a bit older, it, you know, taking the risk a bit later on seems strange, but I have done that. But what it's saying here is that the more you work with other people, the, less, the le lower the risk will be. And this, again, we'll share this afterwards if you want. This is the reason why, and this is the slide from last year, why people invest in groups. So they're sharing the financial risk, they're sharing the due diligence. It's a social environment. I go skiing and walking with uh, people I've met through angel investing. Don't have to do that. There's plenty of other people there to be social with, but I do enjoy their company. Um, education, uh, access to the network, etc. Deal flow, really important, because in the end, we all want as angels, you know, we want success at some point, but the best way of getting success is to have good stuff coming in in the beginning, good quality deal flow. Right, just want to move up to, <laughs> this is a number of differences I've found between um, being a sport and investment. And the first one's really interesting. You won't quite understand what Richard stands for here, but it's the time scales. Richard, and that's his real name, won't tell you more about him, is both an angel investor and he runs his own hedge fund betting on football matches. And he bets on a lot of football matches. He bets about, let's think of the number, uh, I think it's about 20, no more than that, 50,000 bets a day, every single day. He bets the equivalent of the gross national product every year of, 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 of some 70th biggest country. The point about this story here is that when we're investing, we have to wait a long time. You heard the panel earlier on, and the guy standing, was it Gary? You know, he's been going 15 years. He's got a really big business there. He's had the liquidity for some of the investors, probably for himself as well. You've got to wait a long time for a big exit. He, somebody mentioned not the five years or seven years, but the 10 plus years. If you're betting on football or horse racing, you know by the weekend what's happened. That is the really massive difference between a sport and investment. You've got to wait a long time. Investor team size can be too large and too small. Too small. If you're a group of, it, of entrepreneurs, and uh, there may well be people in this room who have just been the sole investor in, uh, in an entrepreneur or entrepreneurial team. That's not good news for the entrepreneur because if you've done that, and I'm sorry to the people who have done that, and, and uh, hopefully you behaved well, but if you were to invest and be the sole investor and you didn't follow on, despite the fact you've been on the board, it's going to be very difficult for that entrepreneur to, to raise money the, the next time round. So you've got a huge duty to continue following on investing or at least connecting to money. Too large, I'm on the board of a company that's got over 60 angels. Now these aren't crowd angels, these are real angels, these are people who know what they're doing. That is quite intensive for the poor entrepreneurial team, the information flow, etc., getting the, the signatures signed, etc. So the team size of the investor base, so the, the sort of 6 to 16 probably for the first round is what I would suggest being the right sort of size. Right, so this is where the team itself, these the investors, can distract pre and post the deal. Pre the deal, this is when you're doing, or we're doing, sorry, doing a due diligence on an entrepreneurial team, and we take a long time over it. We spend a lot of time, because the last thing, and the entrepreneurs in the room who've raised investment will understand this, the last thing you want to do as an investor is to waste the entrepreneur's time. You want to get the money in as quickly as you can to get the entrepreneur building the business. So if there's too many of those, you've got the danger that they will distract the entrepreneur too much. However, providing there's a deal lead, and I'm not sure deal lead's been mentioned that much today, but it's a very important part of it, the deal lead will take that role and feed back to the rest of the angels. Post investor, uh, post investment, of course, you've got the same issue. You've got too many people there on the cap table that may well distract the entrepreneurs, and hence the investor, non exec director, will be the point of contact. So, the other thing I just thought, and again with the sports connection, is becoming the opponent. So, at what point do the investors become the founder's opponent? This was mentioned again by the panel this business of losing control, and there will be a change here. One of the, um, which I'll come to on the final, I've only got one more slide after this. What the final slide is about the fact that we as investors actually cause the failure of about 75% of, of all businesses because we don't carry on investing. So when do we become the founder's opponent? 
component. Misalignment on exit. Now, I've experienced that more than once where I've been on a board and the, there's a misalignment between the wishes of the entrepreneurs, the wishes of the angels and the wishes of the VC. We heard earlier on about VCs on cycles. You know, they want, they need to get out because the, the 10 years is running out or whatever. So the misalignment on exit at board level can be really hard to cope with. In the end, and I've got an exit going on at the moment, which I'm on the board of, the, uh, we've got two VCs, we've got probably 40 angels. Uh, I represent the angels. We're doing what the founders want. We're, we're letting the founder drive this. Blackmail, twice I've seen blackmail happen. One time was really unpleasant where, I don't know whether any exits you've had, it's quite common if an American trade buyer is buying a foreign company certainly this happens in the UK, that they won't, they will not allow drag along to happen. That means they'll want a signature from every single shareholder. The reason they want to do that is because then they avoid the potential litigation from a shareholder that then complains that the deal was wrong. Of course, then it's the situation then that a shareholder can blackmail. And I have seen this happen where a shareholder asked for £25,000 to get that signature, which had to be paid, otherwise the deal would fall through. The deal was worth about $25 million, 25000 in 25 million is nothing, but it was the behaviour of that angel was terrible. And on exit, getting signatures, I mean, that's, and, uh, sorry, on future rounds, not filling in paperwork, promising something as an angel, and then not delivering, having the paperwork have to be changed because that signature doesn't appear, all difficult. We've got to behave ourselves. And finally, this business of equity drying up. So, I'll, in fact, I'll come to that on the next slide. So this final slide is my key learnings. Now, I did give you a few of these a year ago. Obviously, I've learned a little bit more. I've got a bit more gray hair than I had a year ago. Um, I think I said this last year. It took me about four years to realize that one backs teams, one backs people. This is a people business. This is me as an investor, you as investors, backing somebody else, backing the entrepreneurs, backing, you're backing, you're trusting them, having written them a check, that they're going to go and develop a business based on the money you're giving them. It's a huge amount of trust. So you're actually backing them as individuals, backing their ability to take the capital, use it prudently, raise when they have to, again, if not or not, and then pivot where necessary. So although I'm pretty geeky, you know, I've got a computer science degree, it took me a while to realize it's people that really, really matter. Entrepreneurs must be in teams of two or three. This is really important to me. One is too small, single point of failure. Four is too many. Twice I've seen four become three, and I've just been on the board of one where three um, founding team became two, etc. The emotional relationship, you can probably work that out. If you've got a, a, a founding team or in an emotional relationship and that emotional relationship breaks down, it's going to be very difficult to work with that company. Listen, be truthful. The entrepreneurs must, must. This is also with trust again, that they're truthful. Um, prepared to walk through walls, that's fairly obvious. They've really got to solve all the problems in front of them. I believe strongly, and I don't think this applies to everybody in this room, to invest early and add value. I'd really enjoy the adding the value where I can do, not getting in the way, and going in early where the risk is higher, clearly, but the reward potentially is higher as well. Allocate two or three times your initial investment. Uh, there was a slide actually from Marion, which I must talk to you about, which was said something like 32% follow on. Uh, in, I hope that wasn't the number of people who do follow on. It might have been the, the value, but it's really important. If you put 20K into something, you've allocated in your mind another 20 or 40K for follow on rounds. It's almost certain that the first time the entrepreneurs come to you, almost certain, like 99% of the time, they will not achieve what they're promising. That's fine. That's fine. You know, you get used to that, but then you have to fund the next stage. Numbers game, won't go to this in any detail, but the numbers that matter to me, or seem to be, and talk to lots of other people, once you get about 15, it's difficult to keep in touch with all your entrepreneurs on a regular basis. Once you get to 25, you're getting to the point, it's said, where you've got a reasonably good chance, like a very good chance, actually, of getting at least all your money back. 
Think about that one. When you get to 45 though, and I've gone through that about three years ago, actually the spreadsheet's getting rather long. The paperwork, I'm so, at the moment I've got 54 companies that are still in existence after my 67, and I've got to sign paperwork more than once a week. That is pretty tedious. And 90 some magic number that came from some statistics in the States where you can actually meet one of these very, very mythical unicorns. Uh, which will fail because all, <laughs> seems like all the UK unicorns fail. 75% of failures caused by equity drying up. This, remember this, I think I said it last year, but for the people who weren't there, if a company hasn't got to the point where it's breaking even or it's exiting, who's funding the salaries and the rent? We are. We are. And if we don't invest and the entrepreneurs can't find investment from somewhere else, where does it go? It goes under. And the capital availability, it's generally thought in the UK, don't know what it's like here in Ireland, is drying up pretty damn quickly during this calendar year and probably into next year. So all those seed capital is mentioned earlier on because of our somewhat over generous tax incentives, that's my view, my view, not governments possibly, is still available. It's the later stage. The VCs have raised money, will carry on investing, but it's getting more and more difficult to get that. Therefore, companies are going to have to, the ones who can't get to break even, are going to have to reduce their costs to get to that point. Uh, choose your co-investors with care in the same way as you choose your uh, entrepreneurs with care. If you're deal leading, make sure you've got the right people as far as you can do al alongside you. Form a strategy, I think, again, this was mentioned earlier on, and refine and stick to it. Once you've decided you really want to enjoy doing this, decide what your parameters are. And I was just saying, actually, over lunch, earlier on, one of my big fails, I haven't got the, the ones I've missed out slide up, which I use sometimes, but it was a deal in animal health, pet nutraceutical, decided in my living room whether to invest or not. It was a brand, consumer brand, I decided against it, 37x after four and a quarter years. That was a good return, wasn't it? And I didn't invest. But I had a strategy, I stuck to it, I made a mistake. Well, it wasn't a mistake, it was the right thing to do, although <laughs> I'd have put 20K in and brought out three quarters of a million, which would have been good. Um, enjoy the journeys, this is really important, because this isn't just the money, it's also the fun, hopefully. And finally, this which I, I think you've probably seen before, once a check is written to an entrepreneur, you can't get your money back. They're spending the money. You cannot separate yourself from that entrepreneur. Unfortunately, I've been through a divorce. I know what it's like. <coughs> it's easier to do that than to break that bond you've got with the entrepreneur. So this is about the book again. So I've just, in order to, I can't scale myself, clearly no human being can. So I've done that electronically with uh, the book and the podcast. We've only got a low number of minutes left. Am I allowed to ask some questions? Get some yeah, questions? please do. So any, was there a roving, roving mic anywhere? Any questions? Have you got a question? We have a question. Can't see where it is yet. Here. Do you want to shout it and I'll repeat it back again? Uh, what are the warning signs about bad entrepreneur? What are the warning signs about a bad entrepreneur? Well, hopefully you find the warning signs out before you write the check, because as I say, after that you're stuck. So the, the most important things of all, and if you're a bunch of entrepreneurs, I'd put up two slides, one saying, You've got to listen. You've got to listen to the market, the staff, the customers, suppliers. Maybe you need to listen to investors. You've got to work out during the process of due diligence, when you're doing a bit of tech and market due diligence, you're doing due diligence on the people. If they don't listen, you really got to walk. And the other is to be truthful. You've got to make sure, example I often give is a entrepreneur, actually in Cambridge, who says he had a good exit. Turns out it was an insolvent failure. Didn't take long to work that out. Our company's house is very transparent in the UK. That's our co corporate registry. And that was found out. So lying, it comes down to trust. And unless you can trust they're gonna tell you the truth, particularly if you're on the board, so you're getting the whole warts and all so you can help stuff. So that's the main warning sign. So listen and be truthful. Any more? For Gary. Is there any last questions there, folks? One at the back there, shout it out. <laughs> the craziest investment. Wow. Well, I, I, well, turn to what you look at it. The one, another one that got away was actually hydroponics. It was a hydroponic. I don't know if anyone knows about hydroponics, but it's basically water that you charge about 100, 100 you know, it's 98% gross margin. And the reason I didn't invest is because although the, the entrepreneur 
said it was for actually for growing cannabis and I didn't really want to get involved with that. It was a great success. My, it was 5k pounds, about 20 years ago, 5k pounds for 50%. And it was, t it was making about three quarters of a million net in about five years' time. It did actually fail after that. But crazy, I don't really do crazy. No, cra you know, there is a limit to what I do. I mean, one of the things which I really love, which I had board meeting a couple of days ago, which isn't crazy, but it's good fun, is a robot that picks strawberries. You know, there's a whole lot of stuff to do with Brexit and all the other things and general robotization. And that sounds a bit crazy. It's fun. It's a f crazy fun thing. And, and it's all to do with, it's a vision system. The robot's the easy bit. It's recognizing a, a ripe strawberry in a mass of red and green. So I haven't really answered your question, my friend. Doesn't sound crazy to me. <laughs> <laughs> Is okay, that, folks. Uh, uh, Manage, one last question then. Yeah. Just carrying on. Do I need to see, see a South Sea bubble crisis? That is a good. I'm going to modify the question slightly. So I don't think we're in a South Sea bubble. Not that I was, old, you know, obviously clearly it wasn't around then. But I do see that the valuations that are being commanded, the 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 amazingly high seed rounds value. So if you're going to put in, you know, in the old days, by you know, seven or eight years ago, you put so a third of a million, half a million, maybe three, three quarters of a million in at a valuation of a million and a half or something like that. There is good reason to put in a million and a half in the first round, the first proper round, because then you've got longer runway, you can pay more. There's been a lot of wage inflation, particularly in the UK because of Brexit, etc. But the problem is with high valuations is where does it get to in the end? Are the number of exits going to increase? Maybe, maybe not. Are the valuations of the exits going to increase? Probably not. The average exit apparently in the, in the UK is in the low 10 to 20 million. So it's an acquihire or it's an EBITDA multiple, which is small. So if you start at a high valuation and they have some more investing, investments you're up at the sort of 20 million post before long within three years and then you exit at 15. so the only the people right at the beginning will make any money out of that so no it won't i don't think it'll be a bubble certainly in the uk because there's still enough availability of capital but it will prove that and i'm sure there'll be lots of proof looking back in three years time a lot of people have overpaid for initial rounds okay Peter. Thank you that very rather much for depressing that. thought. <laughs> <I will leave. laughs> On that note. <laughs> Thanks, Peter.